triumph and despair, heaven and hell, freedom and codes, love and death. Alan Moore's Saga of the Swamp Thing is a story that not only tested the limits of its hero, but pushed the boundaries of mainstream comics at the time of its publication. In 1985, just 10 issues into his total 45 on the series, Moore was taking major chances that would have long-lasting repercussions for not just the characters within his series, but DC Comics itself. It's impossible to say that a single comic is a turning point for Moore's Saga of the Swamp Thing, especially since he completely reinvented the character with just his second issue, The Anatomy Lesson. But the brutal darkness of issue 29, titled Love and Death, was the moment when Moore and editor Karen Berger became unshackled by a governing body that had shaped comics for decades and sent both Swamp Thing and DC Comics down a darker, more mature path. A brief recap. Swamp Thing believed he was once scientist Alec Holland, transformed into a plant-based beast by a chemical explosion. But his seeming death in issue 20 revealed him to be a totally separate creature who had absorbed the deceased Holland's memories, meaning that a return to humanity was impossible and his central essence was a lie. After overcoming his existential crisis and defeating the Floronic Man to save the woman he loves, Abigail Arcane, and the world as a whole, Swamp Thing embraced his new reality by issue 24. In the time following the conclusion of the anatomy lesson, our boggy beast of a hero would be put through various trials and tribulations. Meanwhile, Abigail's estranged husband, Matthew Cable, would slowly succumb to darkness. Able to alter reality, Matt's descent into alcoholism and anger toward Abigail stirred something wicked in the man. A drunk driving crash leaves Matt dying from his injuries and offered a bargain by a giant fly swallow him and be saved. A disgusting proposition on its own, but one rendered even more vile when it's revealed that Matt's body is now possessed by Anton Arcane. Arcane is Swamp Thing's ultimate nemesis, a disgusting creature and uncle to Abigail. Anton's return as a demonic being in control of Cable's reality-morphing abilities means that rotting flesh and damned souls bend to his will. It's a power that Moore and collaborating artists John Tottleben, Stephen Bissett, Alfredo Alcala, and Rick Veitch would use to make the reader's skin crawl in the issues that followed. While Arcane died right before Moore began his run on Swamp Thing, his reascension to life slowly takes place in the background of issues 20 through 28. It all comes to a head in the four-part horror story seen in issues 29 through 31 and Swamp Thing Annual No. 2. Written by Moore, penciled by Bissett and Veitch, inked by Tottleben and Alcala, and colored by Tatiana Wood. Moore's story is a three-act descent into hell, quite literally. These rotting, nightmarish issues slowly snuff out any light of hope present in an already dark series as Abigail is tormented by her uncle, who performs unspeakable acts as the dead rise, evil urges spread across the country, and hell is brought to earth. Bissett and Tottleben immediately put the reader into a sense of grotesque unease with their opening double-page spread, showing a near-comatose and naked Abby remembering how things turned so vile so quickly. Joyful times with Swamp Thing morph into a hellish descent when Matthew surprises her with a new home, his new job, and his new… friends. Clearly, something is wrong, and Bissett and Tottleben's use of off-kilter panels and Wood's sickly colors invoke creeping evil beyond Abigail's perceptions. But it's the ever-increasing presence of bugs that really drives the point home. All manner of creeping, crawling insects slowly dominate the pages until the story catches up to the present. Matthew reveals himself to be arcane, and Swamp Thing realizes something is terribly wrong. In an interview done while he was still in the midst of writing Swamp Thing, Moore discussed his approach to horror within the comic. What frightens people these days is the things we have coursing through our society at the moment. I think to really frighten people, you have to somehow ground the horror in their own experience, things that they're frightened of. I suppose it's a bit cynical and manipulating, but I do like to put my finger upon the exact nerve, if possible, of what scares people. It's sadism, and I'm getting paid for it. By placing supernatural horror in an American Gothic setting, abstract fear is given a more immediate, physical presence. Bugs are an effective way to gross out readers, but it's the fragility of life that possibly scares the most. A halo of flies has Arcane recall his descent to hell and return. The artists distort the pages even further here, with jagged panels and sickly colors warping into one another. Everything is askew, 
everything perverted by the now extremely powerful Arcane, who spreads his malice across America. Despite Swamp Thing's desperate flight to find and protect Abigail, Moore pulls the rug out from under Hero and Audience. There will be no daring rescue this time. Arcane has already murdered Abigail. How long? How long has she been dead? The story reaches its nadir in the Brimstone Ballet, with Abigail's soul cast into hell. But a gloating arcane is caught off guard by Swamp Thing, whose self-actualization in Moore's previous issues makes him a far more dangerous hero. This is not Alec Holland trapped in a body he longs to escape. This is a new being who has come to terms with who he truly is, Swamp Thing. And in that, the hero has accessed elemental forces that help him break Arcane. This swift turn of the tide allows Matthew's soul to resurface and damn Arcane to hell once again. The dying Matthew uses his powers to restore Abigail's body, bringing it back to life and attempting to pull her soul back from hell. But it's no use. Abby is pulled further down, and Matt succumbs to his injuries before he can reach her. It's a final defeat, leaving Swamp Thing and readers at their lowest low, despite brief glimpses of victory. She lies where I left her. She breathes. Her heart beats. But a heartbeat is not a woman. A breath is not Abby. Her breast moves, but it is empty. There is no one there. The tears come. I close my eyes. And when I open them, Abby is still dead. Love and death is not only crucial to this arc as the impetus of the story, but critical to Alan Moore's tenure on Swamp Thing and DC Comics' trajectory as a company. You see, editor Karen Berger, who had taken over Saga from previous editor Len Wein, wanted Moore to take the risks he wanted to take with his story, and one of the major obstacles to doing so was the Comics Code Authority. The CCA was a self-appointed advisory committee founded in 1954 as an alternative to government regulation after the controversy caused by psychiatrist Frederick Wortham. Wortham's book, The Seduction of the Innocent, had claimed that comic books were corrupting children. In the wake of the Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency in 1954, which largely interrogated the comic book industry, the CCA arose to censor comics and prevent further controversy from endangering the medium. Publishers would submit their books to the authority for review, who would ensure they adhered to their standards, and then publish the books with their seal of approval. The CCA's rules banned sympathetic depictions of criminals, evil triumphing over good, excessive violence, the use of the words horror and terror in titles, lurid art, the walking dead, nudity, most depictions of sexuality, and much more. While the CCA had begun with an extremely strict list of what could not be depicted in comics, the rules had somewhat laxed by the time Moore had come on board Swamp Thing. However, Moore's story for issue 29, Love and Death, was certainly not in line with the Authority's guidelines. At the time, DC Comics had never published a mainstream book without the CCA's approval. Even going so far as to condemn Marvel and Stan Lee's decision to publish Amazing Spider-Man issues 96 through 98 without the code in 1971. Lee's story depicted drug addiction, and the CCA's standards at the time banned any depiction of drug use, even when shown in a negative light. But Karen Berger decided to have Love and Death bypass the CCA review, knowing that it wouldn't have a chance in hell of getting approved. I like the idea of having Swamp Thing free of the code, said Moore, not so that we can do any grotesque physical violence or sex, but so that we can do stories that an adult could read and find something interesting in them. And the fact that we wrote this story, Karen really backed us on that. She really fought for it. And she and Vice President Dick Giordano made this very brave decision to go without the code, for which I'm eternally grateful. The Living Dead, Necrophilia, Incestual Overtones, and Lots of Grisly Death definitely not CCA approved. Funnily enough, issue 30 would once again be approved by the authority, its contents dark but not enough to violate the code. However, issue 31 would go to print without the CCA's approval once again, and all subsequent issues of Saga of the Swamp Thing would abandon the code. The covers now emblazoned with sophisticated suspense to indicate that this was a book for mature readers. Moore's run on Swamp Thing would be unfettered by CCA restrictions and continue to be a commercial and critical success, illustrating that comics could thrive without guidelines and that writers didn't need to be in fear of the CCA. 
Berger would soon go on to publish Neil Gaiman's Sandman series for DC, yet another landmark in mature, supernatural comics, and recruit other writers from the UK, sparking the British invasion of comics in the late 80s. She was our generation, and not only that, she was offering us what we wanted, said Grant Morrison. It was a perfect storm for a bunch of creative punks from Britain who were suddenly being taken very seriously. It culminated in the debut of the Vertigo imprint for DC in 1993. A line dedicated to mature comics free of the CCA and under the editorial stewardship of Berger. Ongoing books edited by Berger like Animal Man, Doom Patrol, Shade the Changing Man, Sandman, Hellblazer, and Swamp Thing were moved to the imprint, while new titles like The Invisibles, Kid Eternity, Preacher, Sandman Mystery Theater, and more debuted around its launch. Even more would come in the decade that followed, with Berger being the mind behind Vertigo. It would shape the idea of sophisticated comics in the years to come and influence generations of writers. My reason for creating Vertigo was to do more really smart, provocative, psychological, edgy comics, said Berger. My ultimate goal was to solely make the line a home where creators could bring their original ideas and have a substantial financial and rights stake in their properties. It was a shared sensibility of my own, wanting to do stories that had social relevance and thematically had something more to them than a light throwaway read. And I definitely wanted to do stories that reflected the world that we live in, particularly in all the oddities and disturbing aspects that would really uncover a lot of the dark sides of human nature, as well as the good sides of human nature. Moore's unshackled Swamp Thing would go on to show just how flexible the character and his comic book would be when it comes to exploring various genres and tones. And it all began with the seed planted in Love and Death. The story continues in Swamp Thing Annual No. 2, Down Amongst the Dead Men, and a desperate attempt by Swamp Thing to save the soul of the woman he loves. During the existential crisis of the anatomy lesson, Swamp Thing had briefly let his consciousness be consumed by the green world. The creature once again separates soul from body, pushing past the green and into the beyond. He encounters Dead Man, the Phantom Stranger, the Spectre, and the Demon as guides on his passage through the realm of the newly dead, heaven, and finally, hell. Along the way, Swamp Thing encounters Alec Holland. Swamp Thing had buried the remains of Holland in issue 28, making peace with the man he once thought he was. Here, their peaceful encounter is a final goodbye to the past. But this is not a story of peace. This is a battle with the forces of evil in the name of love. Swamp Thing's encounters along the journey illustrate him as small and weak in comparison to the forces of good and evil who find their home in the afterlife. It's a striking change when compared to the hero's strength in the physical world and shows us what little hope there is to save Abigail from eternal torment. The demon Etrigan serves as Swamp Thing's guide and protector in hell, but the domain of the damned isn't wreathed in fire. Instead, Beset, Tottleben, and Wood make hell into a place of festering dark rot. It's all spinal cords and melted flesh, twisted creatures made from the fabric of fever dreams. Swamp Thing finds Abby, unconscious and unharmed in the dark domain. Relief at finding Abby unhurt gives way to a desperate, frantic fight to escape. Creatures close in, the panels crowd one another, until Etrigan helps Swamp Thing and Abigail escape from the hordes of hell and a vengeful arcane without a moment to lose. Our dark, feverish journey quickly returns to the peaceful tranquility of the swamp. The cruelty of Arcane defeated, Hell overcome, Abigail returned whole. After so much darkness, what is left to say? Uh, Alec? What? Oh, it's freezing. What the hell are we doing out here in the snow? Uh, Alec? What's the matter? You're crying. But what does it mean that Swamp Thing now controls elemental forces after his self-actualization? And what love could be felt by a creature who was never truly human? Transcendence, love, and the darkness within us all await Swamp Thing in the issues ahead. Freed from the Comics Code Authority, it would be an uninhibited and unpredictable journey.